Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the witnesses. And uh, my questions will be for Mr. Fadden. Thank you for your service to our country. Uh, I'm very interested in, in what you said in your opening remarks, talking about the root causes of IMVE. Can you just give the committee, in perhaps a minute or less, just a, a few overviews of what your what you believe to be some of the causes? What drives people to extremism in this regard? Thank you. I think fundamentally what drives people to this sort of thing is the sense that they are not being listened to. I mean, fundamentally, they come to the conclusion that the political structures that we have at various levels are ignoring them. We find their views sometimes distasteful, and they are driven over time to what we would call acts of desperation. But I think fundamentally, our democratic institutions have not adapted to dealing effectively with people who have views that fall outside of the mainstream. And that is infuriating, and it drives people, I think, to violence. Would you say that uh, if the, you know, the Prime Minister of the country obviously said, you know, certain people have fringe, unacceptable views, he's called people misogynistic, do you think that that fuels any of that? I don't think that attacking views is helpful by anybody, not by you, not by me, not by the Prime Minister. You can disagree with them, that's a different issue, but I think the Prime Minister went a little bit beyond that and I don't think it was helpful. And it's the sort of thing that reinforces the sense that they're not being listened to. I actually disagree with most of the views that were being expressed in that general context, but that's neither here nor there. We need to find some means of dialoguing. Just like when I used to work, I used to argue that we have to find some means of dialoguing, for example, with the Taliban, because if you don't talk to them somehow, you ain't going to stop fighting them. So my argument is you cannot, we cannot start a priori by arguing that they're wrong. You can argue they must not engage in violence. That's an entirely different issue, and I want to separate that very carefully. You pass that line, you become engaged in violence, and you've got to do something about it. But we need to find some way of talking to them. Certainly, and that was certainly the position that the Conservative Party took, that um, we need to not be pouring fuel on the fire because that only makes it worse. It sounds like uh, you would be um, overall in agreement with that position, that we need to open up that dialogue. Uh, I'm also concerned, um, do you feel that sort of any government's um, exclusionary policies, for example, now not looking to debate the uh, mandate specifically, but rather vaccine mandates, the impact they have on excluding those from society, do you think that that could drive people to extremism? I think it can, but on the other hand, if we're going to live in society and live in a society that believes in the rule of law, if you take that view, you have to face the consequences. I don't think you should be ostracized for doing it, but if the law says you have to be vaccinated in circumstance X, Y, or Z, and you're not, and the law provides for penalty, then you have to deal with the penalties. Certainly, um, it's important to maintain the rule of law and, and order in society, but I appreciate the word that you used, ostracized. Uh, we've had several uh, different witnesses talk about those that are ostracized from society, lone wolves, those are who are, feel isolated. So again, do you feel that, um, that anything that isolates those from society ostracizes those from public life, for example? Again, not debating the necessity of that or the validity of that, but again, do you feel that that could drive those to extremism? When we see this, again, we could talk about... Um, um, uh, radical uh, Islamic extremism as well, and, and, and uh, really any form of extremism, but in particular I'm asking about um, a side effect, you could say, of the vaccine mandates and their exclusionary impact on society in, in certain areas. No, I, I think that ostracizing anybody is not helpful, um, and that can range from me ostracizing my son if I'm really disagreement. I mean, you need to find a way to dialogue. But if I can just raise a point I made in my opening remarks, I think it's important to figure out who is best equipped to, to do the dialoguing. I don't think, on the basis of my experience, that the police and the RC and CSIS are particularly well equipped to do it. They have entirely different mandates to sort of try and prevent and to deal with actual crimes. But, you know, it's sort of like, hi, I'm from the RCMP, I'm wearing a gun and I can arrest you, I'd like to dialogue on your views. It's not to be disrespectful of the RCMP, it's just not what they're paid to do, I would argue. Are they, should they be involved in this in some way? I think so. But, you know, it's, it's a role for civil society generally. Uh, and as again, as I was arguing, national security isn't national anymore. It's both international and subnational. So I, I would argue that the federal government sometimes, and this is not a partisan comment, I, I would apply it to both of the major parties, uh, it's not a federal issue exclusively, and I think until we get our head around that fact, we're going to continue to have difficulties. We have to involve the, sub the provinces, municipalities, and also we do involve the international environment far more than we used to. 
But unless we do that and take advantage of opportunities to deal with civil society, you know, and with even school boards, you know, start talking about these things early, we will end up having to use control and punitive measures to deal with the violence.